I want to show you a tweet from a famous theologian named Mr. T. I believe the T stands for theology or theologian. No, it doesn't. It's the actual Mr. T. You know, the one on the A-team in the 1980s, the tough guy. I want you to read what he tweeted. There had to be a crucifixion in order for there to be a resurrection. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in our place. While we were yet in sin, you loved us enough to die for us. And friends, that is true. In order for there to be a resurrection, there had to be a death first. A crucifixion had to happen first. And that's what we're going to talk about today on Set for Life. So I've got this roll bar on my pickup truck that I've had for decades. Me and my dad made it. We made it out of pipe and we welded it together. And I, it, the, the roll bar goes over the top of the cab of the truck and I mount all my antennas on it because I'm a ham radio operator. But this roll bar, uh, after so many years, it gets pretty rusty and you've got to put a fresh coat of paint on it. But you don't just spray paint it. You don't just take it off and spray paint it. You first have to get a wire wheel a grinder and you have to buzz all the rust off of it you have to grind the rust all the corrosion off of the pipe or else it's not going to take a fresh coat of paint now one thing about this it takes longer to grind off the rust than it does to repaint it but you have to do it if you want the paint to stick if you want the paint to apply well today i'm going to apply a fresh coat of paint to you in the resurrection message but first I have to spend probably more time grinding off the old rust of tradition. I've got to get that off of you first, or the paint is not going to it's not going to stick. It's going to take a little time to grind that old tradition off, but that's because I want the resurrection message to stick. I want it to apply. So I'm going to start grinding rust right now. Today, most Gentiles are saying Happy Easter. I will say Happy Resurrection Day, or more appropriately, Hag Pesach Sameach, which means in Hebrew, Happy Passover Holiday. Now, I talked about that last time on Set for Life. We talked about the Passover story. So this one is going to be kind of a part two to that story, where the Lord told them to keep the Passover. Exodus 12 and 26. And it shall be when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service, that you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households? God does not want us to forget the Passover. He doesn't want us to forget that he saves his people. Now, Jesus himself, our Savior, it says in John 2, 13, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Friends, if Jesus attended Passover, then I want to attend Passover too. But there is a new tradition that has come up since then, and it has tried to intrude into the very same week as Passover to try to replace it, to keep us from remembering what God wanted us to keep, the Passover, to make us forget about the Passover. If you look at your calendar, you will see that there's a there's two holidays there's Passover which is the biblical one that we were talked about last time there's also another holiday it's another holiday called Easter now i am not downplaying the resurrection before any of you turn this off and say i'm not listening anymore i'm not downplaying the resurrection at all but this thing called Easter is rather troubling simply because gentiles gentile believers have forgotten to keep the passover service 
Well, Ray, that was for the Jews. Yes, it was. But God said that the foreigner, the alien, which would be us, uh, me uh, as a Gentile, that we can partake of Passover as well. And he wants us to keep that. But the fact that this other holiday has come in, that's troubling to me, specifically because of Isaiah 42, verse 8. It says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Friends, God is not going to share his glory or his praise with anything else that we devise. To illustrate this, I want you to see what happened in Exodus 32, verse 2. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then he said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. A feast to the Lord. Okay, how could Aaron make a golden calf and somehow declare that to be a feast to the Lord? Is that not crazy? Here's this golden calf, and but it's for the Lord. How is a calf for the Lord? That's my question, okay? I want you to hold that for a second. I'm going to grind a little more rust off of you. I want you to think of something else. How could we make Easter bunnies and eggs and somehow make that as a celebration to the Lord also? You see how easy it was to point at Aaron and go, oh, that's crazy. That's nuts. But what about us? Do you see the problem here? If it was wrong for Aaron, it's wrong for us today to bring something in that has nothing to do with the Lord and try to say, but this is for him. We can't do that. God will not share his glory. Also, in 1 Kings 12, King Jeroboam, he did not want God's people to go and worship the Lord in Jerusalem, and so he devised new holidays, and he specifically timed them to coincide at the same time as the Lord's holidays in order to replace them. 1 Kings 12, 32 says, Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah. Wouldn't you know it that at this particular feast, he used golden calves again to initiate this holiday. So, you know, here we go again. Golden calves again. Why calves? Um, they were the ancient Egyptian symbol of fertility and life. And this became known as the sin of Jeroboam when he created a new holiday timed to happen at the same time as the one in Jerusalem to distract people away from worshiping God the way he wanted to be worshiped. It became known as the sin of Jeroboam. Today, we have this new holiday. It's called Easter, and it has been timed to occur at exactly the same time as Passover. Now, we read that God wants us to keep the Passover. He said so. So why is this other one come in? Has it occurred to you, possibly, that the very reason why most Gentiles don't know what Passover is, is because something else took over. Something else tried to take its place and take up wild guess at what bunnies and eggs represent. They represent fertility, the same thing as the Egyptian calves do. Friends, if it was wrong for Jeroboam, to use symbols of fertility to replace God's holidays, then it's wrong for us to use symbols of fertility to replace the Passover, okay? Once something becomes a tradition, though, if you can make it a tradition, it's very hard to grind off because people want to keep it. They don't want to let go of their traditions. Well, we've always done this. Mom and dad always did it. Grandparents, we always, we've always done this in our family, right? It's a tradition. It's, 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 it, we do this. It's very hard to let go of traditions. That's the rust I'm trying to grind off today. Jesus said in Mark 7, 13, this ought to get you. He said, you make the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down. Friends, God wants his people to hand down Passover as a Passover tradition, 
not calves, not bunnies and eggs. He's not going to share his glory or his praise. He told us to pass it down to your children. Make a tradition out of it. Tradition can be good, but tradition can be bad. Okay. Which tradition should we take? Well, obviously, Passover. 1 Corinthians 5 7. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Friends, Jesus is our Passover lamb. He is not our Passover bunny. He is not our Passover calf. He's not a Passover egg. He is the Passover lamb, the lamb of God. I am grinding rust here. I'm grinding hard because we have to do things God's way. I don't want to be guilty of sharing his glory and praise with anything else. I want to be accountable. I am accountable to directly making sure that anybody that hears me understands that God has a way he wants to be worshiped. And if your tradition is in the way, Jesus says, it makes it the word of God of no effect to you. It nullifies the word of God to you. I don't want God's word nullified to me. So stick with me here, okay, as we go through this. Now, you may be thinking, but Ray, Easter is about Jesus' resurrection. Let me give you the best, most simplified answer I can give to that. No, it's not. I mean, it, plainly speaking, it's not. Remember, Aaron said, this calf is a festival to the Lord. The, the, the calf, it's about the Lord. And if you read the rest of that story there, the Lord commanded the Levites to kill 3,000 people who refused to repent of that calf. 3,000 people went down. That's why the Levites were chosen to be priests, because they were the only tribe that would step up to do this action, to kill the people that would not repent. That's where the Levite priest line started at. Okay, but they would not repent of it, and God took it very seriously. Friends, we are not allowed to devise anything of our own imagination to add into what God has already established. Exodus 20 and 25. Look at this. If you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Friends, if it was left up to man's own religious imagination, then when people were going to go build an altar out of rocks, they would take these rocks and get a, a, a chisel and a hammer, and they would chisel out stars and moons and animals and who knows what, all these religious shapes. God ordered that that altar was to be pure, absolutely pure. Whatever the stones you find as you go to build an altar, you take those stones as you found them. You find a stone in the river, you find one in the forest, whatever. You take it as it is. Don't carve anything into it. Don't shape it. Don't cut it into shapes to try to inject your own bias into it. Don't inject your own religious slant to it, or else you will profane it. You'll taint the whole thing. You'll dirty it up. It becomes polluted. Keep it pure. Do not replace God's things with other things that you add. Don't do it to the altar. Don't do it with his holidays. Do not invent new things that God never established and then try to say, oh, but it's about the Lord. Don't put a shaped rock at the altar of the Lord. Don't put a shaped holiday in with Passover or Feast of Tabernacles or trumpets or wh whatever other holidays that God said. There's a lot of holidays that God said that most of my Gentile friends don't even know about. It's what pains me. I want my Gentile friends along with me to know the, the holidays that God set up for us to do. Don't do new holidays. Friends, you know, Knowing this truth about this, that we can't profane our worship, should cause you to rethink all these other holidays that we do. They make God upset. Again, if you look on your calendar, you're going to see that right now is Passover, but there's also another holiday called Easter that has been conveniently timed to coincide at exactly the same time as Passover, just like what Jeroboam did in 1 Kings 12. And the reason that it's there is to try to get us to forget the Passover, the purity of the Lamb, and to profane our worship with God. I'm not going to do it. You decide what you're going to do. I'm not going to do it. Those of you that are still with me, let's keep going. Let's grind off some more rust. I want to show you my responsibility in this matter. Ephesians 5.11.
have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. That's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to grind off the rust. I'm trying to grind off that old tradition before I apply a fresh coat of paint of resurrection. We need, oh, we want that resurrection. We need to understand it, yes, but it's not going to stick. It's not going to apply to you if I don't grind the rust off first. Got to get all that corrosion out of there first, all that bad tradition that nullifies the word of God to you because I want the resurrection message to stick. I want it to become your new tradition. Now, I'm going to show you, I showed it last time, but I'm going to show it again. Acts 12, 4. Now, I want to show you the same verse from two different versions of the Bible. First, the King James says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, this is Acts 12.4 from the New King James Version. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Look at these. One says Easter. One says Passover. Okay, one of them is obviously wrong. Well, how do you know which one is wrong? If you go to blueletterbible.org, it tells us the original language, the original writing, what they originally meant when they wrote it. It tells us that this word, where Easter and Passover are contending for the same space, that word is Pascha in the Greek. In the, in the Hebrew, it's Pesach, Pesach, which is the word for Passover. The reason that the word Easter got put in there in that King James is there was somebody on the panel there that hated the Jewishness of the Messiah, the Jewishness of our Passover lamb so much that they chiseled their own religious bias. They, they carved out their own stone and they tried to replace the Passover to try to steal glory and worship away from, the, from Father God. They have profaned this holiday. They have profaned and interfered with your worship of God, which nullifies the word of God to you because of the tradition that's been passed down to you. How many of you feel like you've been duped, like you've been fooled? Okay, well, now that you know, you can do something about it. You know what's funny is even while I was studying for this message, and I've taught on it many times, but I I was restudying again and Uh, While I was actually studying right here, a friend of mine texted me. He said, Ray, me and my wife were trying to figure out what does, what do bunnies and eggs have to do with the resurrection? Friends, people are starting to ask questions and these weren't Jewish friends of mine. They were Gentiles. They were Gentiles trying to figure out what's it got to do with it. I am here to expose the truth, and I go by a vision statement that says we want to make authentic disciples of Messiah Jesus. Authentic. You want to be authentic. You got to do things the way he told you to do it. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 8, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Friends, Easter is not a doctrine. Easter is a commandment of men. Some man somewhere changed that Easter, uh, that Passover word, Pesach, changed it to Easter, and he shouldn't have done that. Passover is a commandment of God. There's a whole Passover story in Exodus. God said, you shall keep the Passover. Well, Ray, what's wrong with Easter? Okay, What's wrong with God telling us to keep the Passover? To my Gentile friends, you're still not buying it yet. How come you're not keeping the Passover? The Lord God said, keep the Passover. That was for the Jews, right? Yeah, he said the the alien too, if they want to, which which is the Gentiles. Why are you not keeping the Passover? That's the real problem. Okay, something got in there to distract. So now maybe you're wanting to know where did Easter actually come from? Where did Where did Easter come from? Easter came from the Babylonian goddess known as Ishtar. And I don't want you to forget this, that it was the Babylonians. They were the ones that took the Israelites captive for a long time, okay? So that right there ought to be a huge flag for you, red flag. Ishtar, the Babylonian goddess, 
and she was the goddess of, take a, uh, take a wild guess, of fertility. Supposedly, Ishtar had, had to spend a season of time down in the underworld, and that's when winter was supposed to happen, when all the plants and the vegetation died. But when the Babylonians saw the first fruits of the spring start to produce again, their crops came back alive in the springtime when all the plants start shooting up and everything. They figured that was because Ishtar came back up from the underworld. According to them, they believed that the fertility of Ishtar, that Ishtar raised life up from the dead. Uh Uh-oh, you want to talk about resurrection? We're going to get into resurrections discussion right here, I'm telling you. That's another red flag. Ishtar does not raise anything from the dead because Ishtar doesn't even exist. And so I want to show you where Ishtar is mentioned in the Bible. (laughs) I know some of you were thinking, well, Ray, you're just concocting this. No, this is biblical. In the Bible, Ishtar was known as the Queen of Heaven. It was the same thing, the Queen of Heaven, and many Jews worshipped her. And so God sent Jeremiah to call the Jews back to himself in Jeremiah 7.18. The children gather wood. The fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. So, friends, why were the Israelites sacrificing to the queen of heaven, Ishtar? If it made God mad, why would they do this? What was their reason for sacrificing offerings to Ishtar? We find out why they did this in how they reject Jeremiah's call to repentance. In Jeremiah 44, As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you, but we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and pour out drink offerings to her. As we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For when we had plenty of food, We were well off and saw no trouble. But since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. Now, friends, remember, Ishtar was supposed to be the goddess of fertility and of life. And so they figured the reason why they were dying and because their food supply had dried up is because they stopped sacrificing to Ishtar. They figured Ishtar's mad at us, and that's why we are dying all over the place. We need to sacrifice so that her fertility power comes back. Basically, they stop trusting in the Lord for their provision and for their life and for everything, and they started trusting Ishtar to bring it back again. Jeremiah 44, 19. The women also said, And when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, did we make cakes for her to worship her? and pour out drink offerings to her without our husband's permission? The women were basically saying, hey, we got our husband's permission to do this. We're not doing anything wrong here. They said we could do it. My husband said, yes, go ahead and do it. I'm not doing anything wrong. Now, friends, when women sacrifice to a goddess of fertility and ask their husbands to get involved with it, what do you think they're wanting here? They're wanting children, the fertility of children, to have children. They were not looking for God's blessing with children. They wanted Ishtar, the queen of heaven, to give them children. But also they said they lacked everything. We're lacking everything. This means food and and everything they need to live. We're dying, they said. And they figured God couldn't help them. So let's all run to Ishtar. Let's all run to the queen of heaven. She'll do it. God won't. And as God told Jeremiah, he said it. We read it. He said, this provokes me to anger. You know, friends, put yourself in God's position for a minute. Let's say you do everything for your children. You give them a house to sleep in. You give them a nice home. You provide for them, you give them everything, and then they turn on you and they leave. Are you not a little upset about that? That's where God is with it. Now, friends, I think about this and I realize I don't want to provoke God's anger 
any more than I already have, okay? I've already got a past life before Christ, before I got saved. I did a lot of dumb things. I don't want to make him any angrier than I've already done. I want to do the best I can to serve him. But these guys here in the book of Jeremiah, they would not listen to Jeremiah. They would not listen to the call to repent and turn around. Jeremiah was just, you know, he was just the guy that was just trying to warn them. Friends, I want you to realize I'm the same. I'm just like Jeremiah. I'm just trying to warn you that there's some things we need to turn around from. This message might make some people a little angry and they people email me, well, Ray, I don't like what you said about this, that, and the other. Well, I'm just here to warn you, just like Jeremiah, you do what you want with it, okay? But for those of you who are still with me, let's keep going. Jeremiah 44 and 26. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, all Judah who dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, says the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, the Lord God lives. Behold, I will watch over them for adversity and not for good. And all the men of Judah who are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by famine until there is an end to them. Friends, God does this. It's like you want Ishtar to save you so bad because you're dying. Well, that's exactly what you're going to get because I'm not going to I'm not going to go with this, okay? They refused to repent. And God said he would cause them to die by the very trouble that they were calling on Ishtar to save them from. He said you're going to die by the sword and by famine. They said, "Oh no, no, no. Ishtar's going to get us out of this. Ishtar will save us." God says, "No, you're going to go down by the very thing you're scared of." Ishtar could not save them because Ishtar does not exist. The queen of heaven is not real. And because the Lord God alone holds the power of life, it is the Lord God alone who decided how they should suffer for their unwillingness to repent and come back. Jeremiah 44 and 28. Yet a small number who escaped the sword shall return from the land of Egypt to the land of Judah. And all the remnant of Judah who have gone to the land of Egypt to dwell there shall know whose words will stand, mine or theirs. Okay, these people actually fiercely argued with God about Ishtar, the queen of heaven. No, 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 no. We're going to go to the queen of heaven. God says, you need to turn back to me. Well, we're not listening. We're going to do what we said we're going to do. Our husband said we could. We're going to, our kings did it. We've always done it. That's the way it's going to be. There's that stuck on corrosion tradition that won't buzz off. Okay. But God told them, you're going to find out the hard way. You're going to find out whose way is right, mine or yours. Friends, it's so much easier for us to just hear the word of God and repent of wicked traditions. I know some of you are struggling with some of the things you're hearing today, and you just don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. What's going to happen to the people that we're reading here in Jeremiah? They're going to go down for it. It's going to be troubling. God said, you're going to find out whose way is right, mine or yours. It's so much easier for us to just hear God's way and say, okay, Lord, I'm sorry, and just bow the knee and say, forgive me, I'm sorry. So much easier. You don't have to find out the hard way like they're going to do in Jeremiah 44. And while we're here, I want you to see that God said he would preserve a remnant of Judah. He was still working to keep the Davidic covenant, to keep someone on the tribe from the tribe of Judah that would one day sit down on that, that throne there from the line of Judah, from David's line. And who's that person going to be? That's going to be Jesus of the tribe of Judah our Passover lamb. Isn't that great? God was keeping his promise despite the fact that he had to execute judgment. God can execute judgment and keep promise of covenant at the exact same time. Also, these people in this old tradition, Ishtar, they were teaching their kids to search for the first fruits of their crops. We want our crops to grow again. Where's Ishtar? Where's our first fruits of the season? They were teaching them to look to look, to search, to go find it, to go find fertility. And friends, this is where the tradition of bunnies and searching for Easter eggs comes from. It is a Babylonian tradition that was designed to teach their children to look for symbols of fertility without looking for it to come from the Lord God. 
Friends, the Lord is your provider, not the queen of heaven, not a bunny, not eggs, not anything else. Friends, why do we take bunnies and eggs and tell our children, go look for the Ishtar eggs, go look for the Easter eggs, a Babylonian tradition. Go search for those symbols of fertility and then tell our children, but it's for the Lord. How do we do that? How did Aaron put up a golden calf and say, but it's for the Lord? How do we do that to our, why do we do that to our children? Well, it's just tradition, right? Yes. And tradition has caused you to not even know what Passover is. That's the all encompassing problem that I'm talking about here. Gentile Christians, mostly, for the most part, have forgotten God's word. And it messes with your, it profanes your worship. It taints it. I want you to see where resurrection comes from. Who resurrects? It's the Lord. I want to show you. Job 33 and 4. The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. And John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and what? The life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Friends, life is from the Lord. It's from Him only. He will not share His glory or his worship with anyone else. And the last thing I ever want to do, especially during Passover, the holiday that the Lord God asked us to keep, the last thing I want to do is to inject a religious bias that profanes the true sacrifice that God provided for me through Jesus Christ, while at the same time, in doing this, nullifying the Word of God through a bad tradition. Friends, as a believer, I just can't do this anymore. I I can't do it. I grew up with it. I understand it. I'm Gentile as anybody gets. I had all that stuff when I was coming up. I can't do it. Now that I know what the Word of God says, I can't do it anymore. I do not want to be like these people in Jeremiah 44 that told God, no, I don't want to do that. I want to say, Lord God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'll turn around. Yes, let's do it your way. I don't want to find out the hard way. Friends, whenever tradition gets in the way, and tradition can be wonderful. I've seen incredible traditions. I've been to other countries and see traditional differences of how people dress, dancing, things they do. Tradition can be fascinating. But when it gets in the way of the Lord God, when it gets in the way of our worship, you need to grind it off. Ishtar was thought to bring life back to the land when people saw vegetation produce again. And so you can see why Easter was conveniently timed, not only right over the top of Passover, but also in early spring, right when all our grass and our trees and crops start leafing back up and all the weeds shoot up in your yard that you got to go weed eat them down. Everything starts popping back up again. All the fertility grows again. The first fruits are starting to produce again. And I want you to remember why I said, that I said that, first fruits. The first fruits are happening again. And this holiday, Easter, it is actually covering up Passover from the Gentiles' view. They don't even see it anymore. You bring up Passover to typical, most, the majority of Gentiles, they don't have any idea what you're talking about when you talk about Passover. They don't understand what it is. It's still the sin of Jeroboam getting in the way. Now, if you're still not buying the whole Ishtar story, then friend, at least... Tell me why you don't know what Passover is. Can you at least give me that much? Can you at least tell me that? At least admit something got in the way of you really knowing what Passover is. How many of you Gentiles out there have never uh, participated in a Passover celebration? How many of you have never done it? Well, I'm asking the question, why? Why don't you know? It's in the Bible. It's Jesus Christ is your Passover lamb, is he not? Have you not given your full self to Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb, and you don't know what Passover is? There therein lies the problem. So in my study, I found multiple sources that claim from Ishtar folklore that Ishtar commands her followers the following quote, and it says is this, play for me that the dead may rise up. Play for me that the dead may rise up. Are you kidding? In other words, worship me so that I will raise you back to life. That's what Ishtar is trying to say. Now, Ray, this is all about the resurrection. That's what I'm trying to get into, resurrection. 
but I got to grind off the rust that somebody else is trying to steal that glory from God, and God won't permit it. Can you see how Ishtar, Easter, has been devised to directly replace our view of Father God who raised Jesus from the dead, who offers to raise you up too? Friends, do you see the problem? Well, Ray, that's just a made-up story here, this this whole, you know, uh, this Ishtar thing. No, it's not. I showed you in Jeremiah 44, the people said, we're dying. Our food is gone. Children, fertility, we need life to rise up, and we're not coming to the Lord for it. We want Ishtar to do it. The queen of heaven does it. We don't trust in the Lord anymore. They forgot about God, and they would not turn back to him, even when God sent somebody to warn them. Friends, I'm just here to warn you. That's all. If you think Ishtar is just a made-up story, Queen of Heaven, is Jeremiah 44 a made-up story? Am I making this up, or is this written? It's written, friends. And I'll tell you right now, the dead will never rise up at the command of anyone except at the command of the Lord God of Israel. Ezekiel 37, 13. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. Friends, we have read that Jesus Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Let's not taint that altar of sacrifice. Let's not taint and pollute and profane that sacrifice. When the Israelites were slaves to Egypt, God told them to kill a lamb, eat it, burn it, and put the blood of the lamb over the doorposts and over their windows because God was going to send judgment into Egypt and kill all the firstborn. But whenever he saw the blood of the lamb, he promised to pass over, pass over that house and spare all those who were under the blood of the lamb. Friends, we need to get under the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ, not under the blood of a bunny, under the blood of the lamb, our perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ, because God is sending judgment against our sin. It's He's very angry about it, very wrathful, and in order for his wrath to pass over, Gentile, hear me, I said pass over, in order for his wrath to pass over you, then you have got to believe and get under the blood of Jesus Christ, but you've got to repent of what you're doing first, the things you're doing wrong, your sins, you've got to repent of that first before you can get under the blood of Christ. Do not profane the altar. Do not corrupt the death sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, what he has done to save you. Matthew 27, 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Friends, did you know that the resurrection story, it wasn't only Jesus that rose again. A lot of people that had died rose also, and they went and told people the gospel story, that they needed to get right with the Lord. Can you imagine you know, you're in the, living in this day, and Uncle Bob has been dead for a while, but all of a sudden, Uncle Bob crawls out of his grave, and he comes in the house and says, you need to get right with the Lord, friends. You need to get right with Jesus. He's the Messiah. <laughs> what would that do to you? I'm telling you, that is how you spread a gospel story right there, is to get a bunch of dead people to go tell it. Well, friends, we have to realize that it is the Lord God who raises people from the dead. Only he can give life and save his people from destruction. Matthew 28 and 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothes as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. 
Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as he went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Friends, Jesus rose again. (laughs) And it says they worshipped Jesus. They worshipped him. Who did they worship? They worship Jesus. They did not worship all the other people that rose from the dead also. No, only Jesus got this glory. Only Father God was glorified in this. They worship Jesus because he will not share his glory nor his worship with anyone else or anything else we try to profane his sacrifice with. We've got to keep it pure. I want to show you real quickly a video. I went to the tomb of Jesus, and I want to show you that he's not there. I want you to see proof that he's actually not there anymore. Check this out. No, but Going into the tomb. And in that tomb, there's a sign that's been hung there that says, He is not here, for He is risen. 1 Corinthians 6.14 And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Friends, that is the resurrection of Jesus. That's the gospel message, in that since He was raised up, we can be raised up too, along with Him. But you will only Be raised up with him if you will also die with him. This is repentance. This is what the people in Jeremiah would not turn. They said, no, we will not listen to you. We're going to do things our way. We've always done it. My husband said I could do it. Our kings told us, everybody, this is the way we've always done it. We're not turning. Friends, if you want to be saved with Jesus, you got to turn. you got to stop doing things your way, the way I've always done it. Well, mom and dad always told me to do it this way. You've got to do it the Lord's way. You've got to turn, which means you have to die to yourself first. Remember, Mr. T said, there can't be a resurrection until there's first a crucifixion. Romans 6, 5, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is so good. You know, friends, Jesus could not be raised up again until he died first. You have to die to your old life before you can be raised with him. You've got your old life as it is. The sinful things that you're doing that you know are wrong, you've got a million justifications for it that works for you, 
but they don't work for God, you've got to leave all that. You've got to die to yourself. You've got to get right with the Lord and do things his way, or else you can't be raised. Before a resurrection, there must be a crucifixion, and we have been crucified with him. And so I'm going to say the same thing that the angel said to the women. Go quickly and tell others that Jesus is risen from the dead. Friends, as believers, that's what we're supposed to do. You need to be telling people that Jesus is risen from the dead. What does that mean, Ray? It means that if he has been raised up from the dead, you can be raised up from the dead, but you've got to die first. Go tell people that what you're doing is sinful. You've got to stop and do things God's way. You've got to turn and repent, and then you can be saved. That's what he meant when he said, go tell people Jesus is raised from the dead. That's our victory. If you remember, though, the worshipers of Ishtar, queen of heaven, they were looking for food. They were looking for life. Their crops were dying. They wanted it all to come back. They looked for fertility so that they could have their first fruits come back. They wanted their first fruits of the season again. Well, friends, they were looking for the wrong kind of first fruits. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That means that of all those who have died, Jesus Christ is the first one to rise up. And so because he rose first, now everybody else can rise up with him. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You remember the Israelites in Jeremiah 44? They said, we lack everything and we're dying. We're, lo we're losing everything. Friends, you have to lose everything if you want to be saved in Jesus. You can't have everything you used to have and be saved. You got to lose it all. You got to die and be crucified. And so these people in Jeremiah, they worshiped a false god because they were trying to gain material first fruits. They were thinking of their crops out there in the fields. They were thinking of the first fruits of money and all these physical material things. Friends, Jesus is our spiritual first fruits. We need to look to Jesus, not the false gods of materialism. The false gods cannot save you, but Jesus can. Jesus said in John 640, and this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will, I will raise him up at the last day. Friends, if you want to be raised up at the last day, when it's all done and over with, if you want to be raised up to life because Jesus, our Passover lamb was our first fruit. He was the first one to do it. Now you can do it too. You can be raised up as well, but you've got to turn and come to Jesus. You got to have your old self crucified. You got to let go of your old life and then you can be saved. Now, I know this was a tough message to hear, and I know that some of you are going to go off with uh, some mixed up feelings about it, but I want to tell you real quick what this message does not mean. If a friend of yours or a beloved family member asks you to go to an Easter celebration, do not stick your nose up in the air and go, no, Pastor Ray said, blah, 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 and misquote me the things I didn't say. I want you to go and attend. If they ask you to an Easter barbecue or a, a get together, go have fun, have a good time, make memories. But while you're there, tell them about the Passover lamb. Don't, don't be a stick in the mud and go, no, I'm not doing that. Go have a good time. Please do it. Just tell them about the Passover lamb. Tell them about the Jesus Passover lamb that they need to know about, the Passover they forgot. If you want to receive Jesus today so that God's wrath will pass over you, so you're, I, you're afraid now, that's good. <laughs> Lord God, I don't want your wrath to hit me. Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Give me a new life, Lord God, and I thank you. I give you my life. Who I was and what I used to be is gone. I now follow you. I will do things your way, Lord God. Thank you for coming to save me. Thank you. In Jesus' name, I accept your free gift of eternal life. Amen. If you just gave your life to Jesus, I want to hear about it. Go to setforliferadio.com, drop me a line, and tell me it would be of great encouragement to me. Thank you for supporting us on our radio ministry here. We appreciate it. And I always want you to remember that you are not worthless. You are priceless. 
Messiah Jesus died on the cross to redeem you. You'll be set for life.